chapter 10, the landmarks of the face in the oral cavity. Introduction, the dental system must be thoroughly familiar with the landmarks of the face and oral cavity. In addition to being useful reference points for dental radiography and other procedures, the facial features provide essential landmarks for many of the deeper structures. So there are nine regions of the face. There's the forehead, which is the extending from the eyebrow to the hairline, the temples, which are lateral to the eyes, and we set lateral means on the side of, Orbital, which is the eye area that is covered by the eyelids, the external nose, the zygomatic malar, which is the prominence of the cheek, mouth and lips, cheek, chin, and the external ear. Features of the face. The dental assistant should be able to point out the following facial features. The outer and inner canthus of the eye, the ala of the nose, the philtrum, the tragus of the ear, and the tragus of the ear is that little um, protruding bulge that's right in front of the ear, like that holds your 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 head buds or your earphones or your AirPods. That's the tragus of the ear. The nasion, the glabella, root or bridge of the nose, the septum of the nasal cavity, the anterior naris of the nostril, mental protuberance of the mandible, and arch. So the skin of the face is thin to medium and relative thickness. Um, it is soft and movable over a layer of loose connective tissue. The skin around the external ear and the ala of the nose is fixed to underlying cartilage. And cartilage is just a uh, like soft, flexible bone. Facial skin contains many sweats and sebaceous glands. So the lips are known as the labia. The lips are outlined by the vermilion border, and the vermilion border is usually where women put on their lip liner. The labial commissure is the angle at the corner of the mouth where the upper and lower lips join. So those are your actual corners of the mouth. The nasolabial sulcus is the groove extending upward between each labial commissure and the ala of the nose. The oral cavity. It's lined with mucous membrane tissue and it consists of two areas. The vestibule is the space between the teeth and the inner mucosal lining of the lips and the cheeks. And the oral cavity proper is the space contained with upper and lower dental arches. Now the vestibule, the intraoral vestibule begins on the inside of the lips and then extends from the lips onto the alveolar process of both arches. The vestibular mucosa is thin, red, and loosely bound to the underlying alveolar bone. The base of each vestibule, where the buccal mucosa meets the alveolar mucosa, is called the mucal buccal fold. And you can see um, this on chapter 10, figure 10.6. The mucogingival junction is a distinct line of color change where the alveolar membrane meets the attached gingiva. And gingiva is just another word for gums. So anytime you hear gingiva, know that they're talking about the gums. The labial and other frenula. A frenum is a narrow band of tissue that connects two structures. The labial frenum passes from the midline of the maxillary or mandibular arch to the midline of the inner surface of the lip. So when you stretch out your lip, you can actually see the frenum. It's attached um, usually between your two centrals. The buccal frenum passes from the oral mucosa near the maxillary or mandibular first molars to the inner surface of the cheeks. Gingiva. So the gingivae, commonly referred to as the gums, are masticatory mucosa that cover the alveolar processes, processes of the jaws and surround the necks of the teeth. Characteristics of normal, normal gingiva. 
Normal gingivate surround the tooth like a collar and are self-cleansing. They are firm, resistant, and can be tightly adapted to the tooth and bone. The surfaces of the attached gingivate and interdental papillae are stippled and are similar appearance to the rind of an orange. So it's like the outside orange peel, stippled. It has like little uh, texture or dots. The surface colors varies according to the individual's pigmentation. So if you look at figure 10.8, you can see that figure A, it's clinical normal gingivate in light skin in a light skin individual. And then uh, figure B, it's clinical normal pigmented gingiva in a dark skin individual, which means an African American person can have uh, their gums this color or uh, somebody else that's colored, not necessarily um, African American, but have some type of um, skin pigmentation. So a darker toned person will have this. Um, this is also good to keep in mind if you ever work with a prosthodontist, which does removables, um, removables prosthetics, like partials and dentures, or if you move, or, or if you work for a general dentist that does prosthetics, um, sometimes on the lab slips you'll have the option to do regular pink tissue for the dental for the dentures or the partials, or you can, there's going to be a a little box that check that says ethnic, and what that means is that the tissue won't be pink. It's going to come um, like a little bit like a purplish color, and it's more for people who have darker gums. So unattached gingiva, which is also known as marginal gingiva or free gingiva, is the border of the gingiva surrounding the teeth in the collar-like fashion. It consists of the tissues from the top of the gingival margin to the base of the gingival sulcus. The unattached gingiva is usually about one millimeter wide and forms the soft wall of the gingival sulcus. So gingiva, interdental gingiva, also called gingival papillae, extension of the free gingiva that fills the interproximal embrasure between two teeth. So interproximal means in between two teeth, and the embrasure is actually that little triangular space between two adjacent teeth um, where your floss goes into pretty much. Gingival groove, the gingival groove is a shallow groove that runs parallel to the margin of the unattached gingiva, and it marks the beginning of the attached gingiva. Attached gingiva. It extends from the base of the sulcus to the mucogingival junction. The oral cavity proper. So the oral cavity proper is the area inside the dental arches. In back of the last molar on each side is a space that links the vestibule and the oral cavity proper. Okay, so first we have the hard palate. The hard palate separates the nasal cavity above from the oral cavity below. The nasal surfaces are covered with respiratory mucosa and the oral surfaces are covered with oral mucosa. So the mucosa of the hard palate is tightly bound to underlying bone and therefore some mucosal injections into the palatal area can be extremely painful. So sometimes you will come across this where the dentist actually has to give the patient anesthetic on the palate, um, especially if they're working on the mat. Well, not especially if they're working on the maxillary um, arch. Sometimes it's hard for the patient to get numb, so they will give the patient uh, an injection of or anesthe an anesthetic on the palate, and that will make a grown man cry. It would literally make their tears come out. Landmarks of the hard palate. The incisive papilla is a pear-shaped pad of tissue that covers the incisive foramen. An incisive papilla is like a little uh, raised ridge that's right behind your two um, maxillary centrals. You can actually feel that with your tongue. The palatal rogate are irregular ridges of masticatory mucosa extending laterally from the incisive papilla. So laterally means on the sides up, and those are the ridges that you can feel on the roof of your mouth. You can actually feel that with your tongue as well or with, or with your fingers. The palatine raft runs posteriorly from the incisive papilla at the midline. And the palatal glands are numerous small glands that open onto the palatal mucosa as small pits. The soft palate. The soft palate is the movable posterior third of the palate. It has no bony skeleton and hangs like a limp current into the pharynx behind it. 
The soft palate ends posteriorly as a free edge with a hanging projection called the uvula. The uvula is the little dangling thing in the back of the throat. And also the soft palate, it's movable, so it actually goes up and down when you swallow. The soft palate is supported posteriorly by two arches, the fauces. The interior arch runs from the soft palate to the lateral aspects of the tongue as the palatoglossal arch. The posterior arch, the free posterior border of the soft palate, is called the phal palatopharyngeal arch. The opening between the two arches is called the isthmus of fauces and contains the palatine tonsils. The palatine tonsils are the sides, like almost like where your tonsils are on the sides of your throat. Also keep in mind that if you ever work with a prosthodontist, uh, again, a specialist that does removables, um, the, a, a full denture is actually held up by suction of the soft palate. So when you swallow, the soft palate goes up and down. So when you have a, um, a full denture on the top, the full denture actually has to go all the way to the soft palate. And what happens is that when the person swallows, it sucks all the air from in between the gums and the palate of the denture on the denture and it creates like a suction like a vacuum and that that's what helps um the upper denture stay up that's why sometimes the people that have a very bad gag reflex or a very sensitive gag reflex sometimes are not candidates for dentures just because they they can't have anything touch the soft palate because they get nauseous however there are times where the dentist will completely remove the palate portion of the denture, but it's very hard to maintain it up if that's the case because there's no suction from the soft palate. The tongue. The tongue is an important organ. It's responsible for several functions. It's uh, responsible for speech, manipulation and positioning of food, the sense of taste, swallowing, and cleansing the oral cavity. So parts and surfaces of the tongue, the body, which is the anterior two thirds of the tongue, the root, which is the posterior portion that turns downward toward the pharynx. So it's all the way in the back, like almost where your tongue is attached. The dorsum, which is upper and posterior roughened surface, sublingual surface, which covers with smooth transparent mucosa. So sub means under like a submarine and sublingual means under the tongue. And then the lingual frenulum, it's a thin fold of mucous membranes that extends from the floor of the mouth to the underside of the tongue. And if you look at figure 1012, you can see um, the lingual frenum. It's that little attachment that kind of like holds your tongue. It connects your tongue basically to the bottom of your jaw. Um, sometimes you will see that kids who have a hard time uh, pronunciating words or have some type of speech pediment, sometimes it is because their lingual frenum is so short that the child can barely take out their tongue, so it's hard for them to uh, pronunciate certain words. So sometimes the dentist will clip the freedom in order to give the child more freedom with the tongue, and they'll be able to stick their tongue out further, and uh, will be uh, their speech will actually improve. And it's such a simple um, procedure; it's just a little snip, and that's all. Okay, taste buds. It's located on the fungiform papillae and in the trough of the large valley papillae, which form a V on the posterior portion of the tongue. The sense of touch is provided by numerous filiform papillae that cover the entire surface of the tongue. And then lastly, the teeth. Okay, teeth are either single rooted or multi rooted, and we said most anterior teeth are single rooted. All anterior teeth are single rooted, including um, a, one of the sets of the premolars or multi rooted. So the teeth sit in bony sockets or alveoli within the alveolar process of the maxilla and the mandible. In the mouth, a cuff of gingival tissue surrounds each tooth. The portion of the tooth that is visible in the oral cavity is called the crown. So the crown is the only part of the tooth that you can see. It's actually from the gums up. 